All right, hello everybody, this is AW. Here in a, another beautiful day. Don't think you can actually see it very well. Huh? You can kind of see the clouds. The clouds are very nice today. Uh, they were really beautiful yesterday. Uh, if I wasn't too lazy to uh, grab my good camera, uh, my DSLR, uh, I'd actually get some amazing pictures around here, but uh, it's, it's a hassle and uh, I don't know. It's not that I can't make it work. It literally just takes me, I don't know, maybe like 10 minutes of extra effort, uh, somewhat, to uh, just transfer things from my good camera to my phone and do some uh, slight editing on uh, on my phone. But I don't know, it just... I'm one of those kinds of people who, uh, if you can't do things, uh, you know, as best as you could, uh, I don't really feel like doing them, uh, if you know what I mean. It's, uh, it's not quite perfectionism, it's just uh, being disappointed with uh, knowing what you could do if you had your hands on the proper stuff, which you've had your hands on before, uh, but you know, uh, due to uh, the necessities of life, uh, you're forced to be simply, you're forced to simplify. Uh, and that in itself teaches you something, definitely. I mean, uh, I've learned a, a couple things about uh, phone photography and, uh, and whatnot. But uh, nonetheless, it uh, it's less than what I would be doing if I had my good camera. And so, I don't know. Uh, should get off that uh, lazy streak for a bit. Uh, <laughs> just waiting for people to uh, filter in uh, here for a little, a little bit. Uh, stuff to be talking about. Anyways, the title. I've had this uh, long-running dialogue with a uh, Levinasian uh, on email, mostly through email, well, entirely through email, actually. Uh, ever since, I think, uh, end of November last year, uh, December. <whistles> Get over here. Come on. Uh, and uh, much of it is just uh, kind of a back and forth of, well, uh, does Hegel mean this? Or, you know, like, uh, isn't he, you know, isn't this a problem for Hegel and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, you know, that's all well and good. Uh, it's it's fun. I like to explain things to people. Uh, but things reach a certain point at which uh, you feel that you've hit a wall, uh, communications-wise, in which, uh, you know, either you have to give or they have to give, and if nobody gives, then, uh, you know, there's not going to be a, a way to step forward from the impasse because uh, uh, fundamentally you're working from antithetical, incommensurable points of view uh, from one perspective, uh, in a way. Uh, and much of it has come down that, uh, you know, uh, I don't know much about Levinas. I didn't know much about Levinas. All I ever heard about Levinas uh, prior to this uh, person contacted me was uh, uh, from a lecture by Bernstein uh, in the, his uh, Phenomenology Spirit lectures, and he basically called Levinas an idiot. <laughs> All I knew about Levinas is like, oh, Levinas, so doesn't he have like this philosophy about otherness and, um, and, and ethics? And that, that's how I knew. And so anyways, I've been having this back and forth with this guy, probably something like a, and I, I mean, it's it's long emails, uh, you know, it's not just like uh, paragraphs long, but uh, some essay, essay length stuff. And the main issue is, uh, you know, uh, Levinas takes the other to be absolute, Hegel does not. And so, you know, what, what do we make of that? You know, is there a failure in Hegel and, you know, thinking that he can totalize everything or is there a failure in Levinas to think that you can't totalize? And so, you know, that seems to be the fundamental divide. Uh, But I quickly came to understand, uh, you know, I, I'm, I don't know, I have a quick wit for this in which uh, I notice that people are talking past each other. I notice that I talk past people and I notice that people talk past me. Uh, and uh, with this guy, uh, we've, we've been talking past each other. And, you know, well, he's the one who asked me about Hegel. And so, well, you know, I'm comfortable talking Hegelese. 
and explain things according to the, Heg the Hegelian standpoint. And if he has issues with it, well, you know, um, nothing I can do about it. Uh, that's A-OK, -okay, that's fine. But there comes a point in which, you know, uh, you have to realize, you quickly realize, well, the other person responds and they talk to you. Uh, well, you know, isn't the other this? And you're like, no, no, it's not. Uh, you know, just go to the uh, sec proper sections of the science of logic or where whatever concept you're talking about. Read that and that that's all it is. And they're like, but, you know, can't you say more? And no, no, you really can't. Uh... And that's basically the stand, the standpoint where we've gotten to, and uh, in which, uh, you know, uh, after what has it been, <laughs> December, maybe five months, almost half a year. Yeah, no, nah, it's it's definitely uh, about five months. Uh, this issue just keeps coming back up, and I'm like, uh, I've responded a few times of you're you're talking past me, you know, we're talking past each other, uh, you know, unless we figure this thing out and uh, agree it, agree to some kind of term. Uh, term here, uh, specifically contents to that term, uh, we're not going to get anywhere because, uh, you know, you talk about the Levinasian other and you bring in all these other things and then you go like, oh, you know, can't we think of Hegel's other in this other way? And you're like, no, uh, you know, it, it's like talking about Levinas, you know, is Levinas's other Hegel's other? No. You know, would I talk about Levinas's other if, for example, in the most concrete sense, uh, Levinas means the other as a person, as an individual human being. And, uh, you know, is that what Hegel talks about when he's talking about the other in the science of logic? Fuck no. <laughs> the other is just a basic ontological category. Um, it's, not a, it's not a very deep category at the beginning of the logic. Uh, you know, there, there's a sense in which Levinas is talking about the Hegelian other uh, in an ontological sense. Uh, metaphysical sense, but then there's just a far more expanded sense in which um, Levinas doesn't really care about that particularly, he cares about it in the ethical sense. And so, uh, you know, I keep telling this person, we're not talking about the same thing anyways. So, you know, uh, yeah, un unless we can, uh, you either uh, want to know exactly what Hegel's talking about or, you know, we want to... Uh, have some kind of dialogue at some other level, you know, uh, talk about specifically what are you, what are you interested in. Uh, there's going to be no no clarifications going forward. It's there's, you know, we disagree and and that's about it. You know, uh, I say the other, you say the other, and we're talking about two completely different different things. Uh, it ain't going to work out. Uh, so, anyways, uh, we'll see where that goes. I've been reading. I've read uh, the first chapter of a book uh, on Levinas, his general philosophy. Um, you know, I can't even say I, I disagree with uh, much of anything. It's not much uh, much to disagree with, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, you should let other people be, you know, that you can't force your upon the other, that you can't exert your will upon them, you know, that the other is the other internally and all these other things, and, and you know, to try to do these other things where which, you know, he takes to be parts of the logic of identity and uh, unity and universality, and he, he thinks that they're violent inherently because of that, because they can't let the other be. And, you know, even stuff like that, I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, I, I can agree. Uh, absolutely, you know, no problem. Uh, of course, you know, I have a whole different other language for that. It's not just about the fact that the other, you know, has to be let other. It's about freedom. Uh, you know, that if we're going to, to be a society of freedom, yes, you got to let other people be. Uh, but, you know, beyond that, there's there's a simplistic way in which, uh, you know, otherness is taken for, uh, uh, by loving us. <whistles> Come on! Uh, so, uh, probably the, the strangest thing, and I mean, I'd have to re-finish that book. Uh, it's not a very long book, it's only about 260 pages. Uh, but I don't know about you, but things things uh, feel long when you're not interested, honestly. Especially when you, you feel that things aren't new. Uh, I get bored very quickly. I don't know about anybody else, uh, where you, you're reading a text, especially a philosophical text, you know, the dense texts. And... Uh, it's not even that you disagree, like, 
if you disagreed with something, it'd be fun. Uh, you know, at least you know you're going to respond to somebody. And you you're writing furiously. You know, at every line, oh, this is wrong. This is wrong. 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 Uh, it's another thing to read something which you can only say, well, I agree. I just don't think it's the full truth. And that's most of it. You know, I agree in that I just don't think it's it's the full thing. What is Hegel's idea of freedom? Uh, self-determination. The meaning of self-determination is obviously something <laughs> very, very, uh, very deep. Uh, I don't know where, where, to what point you uh, tuned in, uh, Leithlin. I've been talking about Levi Nas and Hegel. So you know, like uh, Levi Nas uh, comes from a phenomenology background. Uh, he's his main uh, interlocutors uh, for most of his career. Uh, the made the big ones are Husserl uh, and mostly Heidegger. Uh, and so you know, when uh, people uh, this Levi Nasian I've been having discussion with. Uh, you know, bring Hegel up, uh, there, there's a limitation to what's going on in that, uh, you know, two different starting points are, are, are being used in which, uh, you know, Levinas hardly talks about Hegel, apparently. Um, and he does talk about Hegel, he talks about it in an interpretation that was popular in France, but which isn't Hegel as such. Uh, and so, you know, this totalitarian identity, philosophy, etc., that's what he takes Hegel to be. And of course, you know, uh, Levinas actually lived through the Holocaust. He was in the internment camps. He was a Jew, uh, a Russian Jew, ends up living in France, philosopher, theologian, and whatnot. Uh, and it, it, you know, it shows in his philosophy. And uh, it's nothing bad. It's just that, you know, you see it and you see where an existential basis comes into that. And, uh, you know, he is a kind of existentialist where part of the point of his philosophy is that he doesn't want you to try to take this in some universal categorical way uh, he wants it you to take it as in a, in a very personal way so you know, he talks about the other you're like well aren't i the other for everybody else and you know, doesn't everybody else have like these kind of uh, ethical duties and you know um, responsibilities towards me and then levinas would say apparently according to the author of the book that i was reading uh, levinas would say and you could think that way but uh, that's not legitimate because you know that that scrubs away the otherness uh that's from your own experiential background, completely other, you know, like uh, you can hypothetically put yourself in the, shoe of, the shoes of someone else uh, and pretend that, you know, you can cognize for them, but uh, you can't, uh, you know, that's, uh, so, you know, the other is always other to you, you know, the point is about otherness as a standpoint for you, you know, that otherness isn't this abstract otherness, it's this, this uh, raw, visceral otherness, you know, that... Uh, so you can tell the phenomenological distinctions and beginnings there, you know, that this, this comes from a whole different place than something like Hegel, which is, you know, more abstract logic, uh, you know, uh, just intelligibility speculation. So just on those grounds, uh, you know, there's already, a, there's already a, an issue of communication, which uh, the standpoint that uh, Levinas begins with is just not commensurable with Hegel's uh, in that... For Hegel, this is not a, a legitimate beginning because it's not critical enough. Uh, whereas, you know, Levinas would say, no, Hegel's is not a legitimate beginning because it's not critical enough. You know, it's still, it's, it takes a standpoint as logic, but, you know, the real standpoint has to be the standpoint of consciousness of, you know, this raw phenomenology of otherness. Uh, at least that's how I understand it. I'm not claiming to be a, an expert in Levinas here. But then you take this raw standpoint of otherness, uh, and then Levinas gets an, an ethics out of this, um, which I don't understand how you get an ethics out of this, um, as he does it. Uh, I'd have to probably read the book. There's a, definitely a build-up there somewhere, but uh, Levinas is not exactly a systematic philosophy. He doesn't have that interest. Uh, in which, you know, there's uh, the way I comprehend it, given the examples in the book that I'm reading, uh, is that Levinas get his standpoint on ethics uh, from the ancient customs and uh, of hey what are you doing hey the ancient customs of hospitality you know uh, for example he gives a story of the good Samaritan uh, in the Bible uh, how that's uh, you know 
one of the standpoints, one of the examples he gives about what ethics is about, you know, that when you're, when you're hospitable, the ethics of hospitality is that, you know, you, despite you uh, lacking the means or, you know, being of modest means, um, you know, somebody comes by, they need a shelter for the night, uh, you know, there's only one bed, but, uh, you know, the rule of hospitality is you make uh, make the guests comfortable, you know, it's not about you, it's about them. And so this is the kind of standpoint that he has, that the his ultimate uh, ethics is that it's always about to the other, not about you. Which is uh, interesting, and I think there's a truth to that, uh, as far as ethics goes. You know, there's, definitely, there's a definite truth to that, you know, a lot of this... That there are certain ethical things to do, which, uh, you know, in which you won't get... Uh, a reciprocity uh, back to you, and you know, and so uh, Levinas's philosophy of otherness is also that he puts the absolute, the other as absolute. You know that uh, we take a standpoint in which you know the other always always has infinite worth. You know, and uh, compared to us, that we always have these duties to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, other things to go with that are, oh God, I had in my mind, and now it slipped. It's okay. Ethics of hospitality, infinite value of the other. Uh, maybe I'll remember it along the way. <laughs> so yeah, you know, in that in that sense, I can understand. Um, oh yeah, uh, you know, he he wants a philosophy that is not egoic. You know, because he thinks identity and universality is always egoic. You know, things always tie back to me, uh, which is an interesting way to interpret that. I don't think that's true. Uh, I think it's only egoic. Uh, it's only self-centered when you don't uh, take a genuinely universal standpoint. Uh, you, you know, so I don't think universality and identity necessarily leads to egoism, although we can all understand uh, how it does. Uh, but likewise, a philosophy of otherness does not lead to <laughs> non-egoism. Uh, as a matter of fact, the opposite tends to be true, uh, that a philosophy of, of genuine otherness uh, tends to lead to egoism. Uh, it's kind of what has happened. Uh, yeah, you're about 17 minutes late. Hey, Dan. It's, it's just been me talking to myself, so uh, don't worry about it. Uh, just talking about how uh, absolute identity or absolute otherness uh, you know, don't, don't seem to necessarily lead uh, to certain places. Uh, I'm at the usual place. Uh, I'm just like walking uh, down the, the tree aisles. See if I can find it. There's these like little lemon things. Like uh, they have a little uh, orchard here. A couple rows of these uh, interesting exotic uh, limes and uh, well, they're all citruses. Uh, limes, tangerines, uh, and some other weirder things that are lemon-like, but uh, it'd be weird if we called them lemons. They're pretty good. Like, you know, they're nice and they, they have a nice tangy sourness to them. But anyways, uh, for example, a philosophy of uh, absolute otherness, if you really took it as otherness, uh, you know, would uh, at the same time mean that you are a self-enclosed separate unit from everybody else, and therefore you would be right to be egoic uh, <laughs> in the exact same way. You know, a metaphysics of otherness is just about as egoic as a metaphysics of identity in which, uh, you know, uh, you may be a, a nihilist. You, may, well, you may be a solipsist, you know, to put it that way. Uh, and that's egoic, but nonetheless, uh, there's also an idea. Both, both standpoints have forms uh, which are both egoic and non-egoic. And so, you know, I think Lebanon is full of shit uh, when he pretends that this philosophy of otherness uh, necessarily leads to what he wants, uh, which is one of the issues I have with him. I don't see how he gets his ethics out of a, an ontology of otherness. It's just not possible. Um, 
not not in the way he does it. It is possible. <laughs> I mean, I think you can get an ethics out of ontology, but not in the way he does it. Uh, but then again, you know, I probably might have to read further in that book to figure out how he does it, because right now it's not clear to me how. What are you doing? I don't even know what the hell he's... he's... You can see them around here, actually. Yeah, I sent him an email today, you know, and I'm like, you know what, we're talking past each other, and like, I, I get that, you know... Uh, well, I get that we, we've been talking past each other. I've said it to him multiple times. Uh, and it's just, you know, uh, he doesn't really, like, he hasn't really laid off it. You know, he still keeps trying to uh, project Levinas into Hegel. And uh, what I told him was, uh, you know, un unless, uh, you know, we can, we can agree on some term here, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to continue this. Like, it's, it's pointless. Come on. Come on. Yeah, and it's not just the terminology, it's it's confusing the terminology. You know, he says the other, it's fine, you know, but just don't confuse it with Hegel's other, and that's it. Uh, you know, but he keeps trying to be adamant that, you know, it must be like what Hegel calls the other. I'm like, but but it's not. Uh, you know, it really isn't. And so, you know, it, it just makes communication so much more difficult if you can't accept that there's a difference. Uh, you know, if we can accept there's a difference, uh, well, it's the same way, you know, people... <laughs> It's just what people do, Dan. Like, I mean, like, you think a certain way and, like, you, you're adamant that you're right. Uh, and, you know, you feel that you, somebody says something and you feel that it has to mean what you normally used to mean. It, it takes some practice to get, to get out of that habit that, you know, somebody says a word that you understand uh, and that you think, I mean, like, the association is there, you know. They say being, you think being, but according to your own terms. Uh, you you have, it takes it takes quite a bit for you to uh, you know get out of the habit. What are you doing? Come on! No, I think it's because there's because there's some water being sprayed and yeah, he he hates water. Uh, but yeah, you know like uh, so I just told him like look if if by the other you like I told him that uh, we could continue the conversation. Here's. Some funky ones. These are actually really nice. Like they're, I don't know if you like, yeah, what are they called? Mandarins, tangerines. Uh, these are actually quite a bit smaller. And he has these other ones, which are actually even smaller than that. Um, they're nice and uh, they're really nice. Yeah, people people get uh, caught up in their whole things. Uh, some people get it, some people don't, and that's what I told him. <laughs> I'm like, you know, we're 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 the others here, you know. And uh, the funny thing is, I'm I recognize that we're the others here. Um, it's it's kind of weird that uh, you know, it has, he's the one who has the philosophy of otherness and uh, keeps projecting onto Hegel. Uh, so. So yeah, it's not too bad. Uh, but yeah, so I just told him like, you know, if we can agree that, that we are using the terms in the wrong in the different ways and we can agree to not cross over terms and say like, well, you know, the other can't really be this thing because Hegel says it, or the, it can't be this thing because Levinas says it. If we can just accept, okay, this is what Hegel means, this is what Levinas means, and when we talk about it, we'll talk about it in the proper levels of terminology because depending on what the other means for Levinas, the proper term to translate it into Hegelianism as close as possible is not the other. You know, uh, you might be talking about another person, you might be talking about infinite subjectivity, uh, you may be talking about such things, but you're not talking about the very basic category of, of otherness. That's not what Levinas is talking about at all. So, you know, it's, you, it's kind of what I, I got tried to communicate to him in which, uh, you know, un unless we can agree to that, uh, we're not going to get anywhere. Let me see. Okay, you see this? This is 
called the caviar lime. These things are expensive, <laughs> but nobody's around, so uh, let me crack it open and show you what it's like inside. They're really nice. Okay, you can't really see it. Uh, I don't think you can see it. Like You can see the graininess a little bit. There you go. You see that? They look like little pearls. That's why it's called caviar. And uh, they're like rock candy. You know, what are those things called? Uh, pop rocks? But it's just pure lime. They're really awesome. Anyways, they make some like uh, really nice snacks. So I gotta just step back and find where Balboa's at. Troubles of uh, trespassing. <whistles> well, anyways, so enough about the Levinas gay. not much to say about that other than, well, you know, we disagree and uh, that's not going to go anywhere. Uh, God, I have, there was other interesting stuff that happened in the news. Uh, I was going to talk about it and now my mind is blank. Hmm. Well, let's get back to what I was talking to you about last, uh, yesterday, Dan, about uh, the whole, the idea thing. To bring it a... Uh, Bringing a bit of a circle from what Leah Lynn asked earlier about self-determination. I don't know how clear that was uh, to you. Because it really is like such a weird idea at first. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of funny. Yeah, the concept object idea. Now, that's it. It's, uh, the idea is the totality, which is, you know, the, uh, the process of concept and object. You know, it's how an object realizes itself. Actually, I mean, like, I've had this uh, the discussion with the Levinas guy has actually been uh, about a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's an objective thing, and you know, it exists independently uh, to the extent that it exists uh, independently. <laughs> it exists because <clears throat> you know the the objectivity of emotions, for example, obviously, you know, don't exist independently of us as subjects, uh, but they also. Uh, well, actually, no, that's an interesting thing, isn't it, right? That, uh, you know, we can't will our emotions uh, for the most part. You know, you can't will to be happy. You can't will to love. Uh, you can't will to be surprised. You know, emotions, in a way, happen to us. Uh, you know, they're, they're objectively, uh, you know, other than us. Uh, and so, you know, they're subjective. You know, they obviously depend upon our being. But at the same time, you know, they're, they're kind of like thoughts. You know, they, they happen to us more so than uh, being something that we will.
Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, like, having the idea doesn't mean that you have, like, a... Um, um, no, yeah, actually, uh, the division between, like, emotions and thoughts, like, the... Is... Uh, is not absolute, you know, no, no division is absolute, really. Um, you know, the, the early, uh, the early modernist uh, rationalists, like Descartes, for example, like, uh, just said, like, these are all different modes of the mind. Uh, you know, the mental phenomena is nonetheless mental phenomena. Uh, the concept is the universal, it's the idea. Like, when he talks about the concept, it's, it's the idea but it's the understanding of the idea as a real thing. So, you know, it's not just this abstract concept. And that's the difference between the idea and the concept. The idea is the reality of, of a concept. You know, the idea of gravity is the fact of gravity. You know, it's not just this thing in your head, it's a real thing. Uh, and we don't understand, and like uh, what I was telling Dan yesterday was, uh, that one does not understand the idea uh, in pure concept, you know, you understand it uh, when you've experienced the idea as a reality. Uh, only then is it idea. Prior to that, you know, it's just a, a theoretical concept in your head, you know, it's a kind of what if, uh, you know, like, I understand this in theory, but you know, what does it actually mean for me in, real, in reality? Uh, it's that kind of thing, you know, that uh, we can have, we have so many theoretical uh, Posits and uh, concepts in, in our modern society and for the most part, you know, uh, we really live uh, with the Conscious and unconscious attitude towards them as merely concepts, you know, that we don't really believe that they're real You know, uh, we're taught them by school, you know, we learn this because somebody tells us, you know, but uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really strike us as, as a reality, you know, and so we just have this concept, but uh, we don't really believe it uh, in a way because <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Dan, that's uh, That's pretty pretty much it That in grasping the idea we understand that it read that it is a reality <whistles> Where did this guy go? You know, he definitely doesn't get lost, but... <whistles> Baboa! Uh, and so... Stuff like that. Um, it's really simple. Uh, in a way, it's also very, very complex. Like I was trying, trying to tell you uh, about like, the practicality of it. Like you know, the idea, <clears throat> the idea in the most, the most full sense. Uh, <clears throat> oh God, is <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Oh God, didn't bring any water. <laughs> <clears throat> Balboa! Probably went back to the car. <laughs> He's done that to me before. Before He's like, I don't want to go there. He just walks back, tries to walk back home. Uh, anyways, okay, there, there you go. My voice is back. So the, the extent of the idea, you know, in the most powerful sense is, is an activity that, you know, that you don't grasp uh, the reality of a concept unless, you know, you're doing something with it. That's what I was telling you about uh, yesterday. And so for the most part, even things that we think we understand, you know, remain only theoretical uh, to a, a large part. You know, something like the theory of gravity, for example, um, is not really an idea of gravity. It's, it's a very abstract notion of gravity that we have in which, you know, we can... We know we must take into account this real effect. Um, we know sort of how you know we know how it manifests in certain necessary ways, 
but you know overall we can't do anything directly with it and so you know when you get to that that level of uh of activity where you actually do things that's that's the level of idea um, God, I had something about that uh... oh yeah so anyways uh moving on I was watching this thing on a <clears throat> uh, I don't watch Joe Rogan the, the podcast like his uh, the Joe Rogan experience podcast uh, very much I usually just tend to uh encounter every once in a while for other things that I'm looking for and I find them interesting. Uh, but anyways, it was this bit in which uh, he had an interview. He was interviewing somebody. Uh, I forget what his name. I think his, his name was Adam. I think like uh, from a show called Adam Ruins Everything. Uh, and it was about uh, the issue of one uh, transgender people uh, competing. Yeah, yeah. Transgender people competing in, uh, for spe particularly transgender uh, male to female. Uh, it's, God, that's, I don't like that because it's, in a way, it's, it's false. Uh, uh, nobody transitions from male to female. It's impossible. Uh, you know, you can transition your gender, but you can't transition your sex. You know, it's a uh, man to woman, let's say. Uh, uh, and it's about the issue of uh, how, how it's unfair uh, just totally unfair that, say, uh, a man who is physically male, you know, transitions uh, in a sport, you know, they're, like, there's there's a couple things, particularly with physical uh, uh, competitive sports. Yeah, and then competing in sports. So, you know, like, you're a, a, ma you're a male who is competing in, you know, the uh, mixed uh, martial arts. Uh, and you know, in, in that arena, you are you know all right, kind of like you know mediocre, and then you transition to female, and you go to the females like you know mixed martial arts, and you dominate. Uh, and this did happen, uh, and it is absolute bullshit. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, he's like he brought up this whole thing about you know there's a reason we don't have women fighting men in boxing or in mixed martial arts, and the reason is not because of sexism. The reason is because there really is biologically, uh, physically, a huge difference in the capacities of force. Uh, and so, you know, somebody who's a male transitioning, uh, you know, to a woman, uh, then being accepted into the woman's sport is absolutely unfair, you know, by all standards. Uh, you know, and they go in and they wreck shit. Uh, and so, and uh, Joe asked him, well, you know, isn't that unfair? And the guy actually, you know, you could see him squirm. I mean, he was uncomfortable with it because, you know, there's the ideology of equality of, oh, well, you know, everybody should be able to do anything and everything. You know, the, this whole this whole difference, you know, it's it's a myth, right? Um, and, you know, and like he tried to justify it about, it, well, you know, we're going to have to like deal with certain things. Uh, but the issue is pretty straightforward, man. I mean, truth be told, uh, you know, you're if you're if you are a biological male, you developed as a male, and then you transition later, and you you engage, you go into like a woman's sport, and you totally dominate. Um, that's totally unfair. You know, it, it kills the whole spirit of the sport, anyways. Um, in the fact that you know it's a completely you're putting different leagues together. Uh, Uh, well, there is no, as far as I'm aware, there is no manly woman that can achieve the peaks of what a, a biological, physical male can do uh, in terms of raw force. Yeah, they're divided by weight class, but, you know, there's no higher weight class, for example, if uh, of, like, you know, the weight class of a male boxer. To a, a woman's uh, a woman a female boxer, for example, uh, there is the top weight class for each one, and they are not equivalent. So you know, uh, what weight can you have somebody competing, for example, if they are the only person in the weight class because you know they're 
transgender. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, I thought it was interesting. Uh, but that's not the most interesting thing. Uh, the most interesting thing was about uh, the idea of children, uh, you know, being uh, treated with hormones, uh, you know, for transitioning. Uh, the issue of physicality is actually uh, more complex than just weight. Uh, like there's there's bone structure differences, there's muscle structure differences. Um, Joe actually brought some of that stuff up, uh, and he would know more because he's a fighting guy. No, yeah, like you know, uh, Joe brought up the points about how well you know it's one thing that your kid you know is like three years old and says, well you know they're a boy. Uh, and they want to transition to uh, to a girl, and uh, okay, you know, fine. You know, there's let them. There's nothing. There's nothing to be done about that. There's nothing wrong in like letting it. Uh, but then he says the whole hormone treatment thing is is problematic in the that we don't know what we're doing. You know, you don't know that people will regret things. You don't know that people you know, might change their minds. Uh, you don't know that this might cause long-term effects which we're not aware of and, and like I mean uh, as far as stuff like that goes uh, he's right uh, more so than even he knows uh, you know we don't know for like it's very recently that you know we still find a lot of shit that's new with how hormones work with our body something like testosterone for example is not just like oh well it gives you muscles and makes you gives you a, a scruffy voice um, it actually has uh, a lot of other important um, biological functions with how you metabolize proteins, with how you metabolize uh, uh, plenty of other things, and how your body literally functions. And so changing the hormones is actually a big deal. Uh, uh, and so the idea of, you know, treating kids with hormones is is uh, certainly something that <laughs> seems to me highly irresponsible. So, you know, like Joe said, like, well, you know, it's one thing to uh, let somebody who reaches 18 or, you know, 16, me even 16, you know, it's like, they know, they, they, have, uh, they have developed their own sense of self, they have, you know, an intelligibility and reason for why they want to do things and so you know let them do it then and you know stuff like that at that age you know you're not you're not so far gone that you know you can't pass anymore or whatever uh, which is really the main worry like that you can't pass uh you know it's not really about anything else so yeah you know i, I thought about that uh, but uh you know what is it the other guy brought up stuff about like well you know we don't really we don't really know what the consequences are um and that reminded me of the whole thing about the, the, the nature of the future in which, oh, of course, uh, we don't know what we don't know. You know, uh, indeed, uh, this is kind of, it's, it's sort of the, the, the issue of, uh, of, uh, of new developments. Right, in which, um, you know, maybe, maybe it turns out that this is viable, maybe it doesn't. Uh, but, hey, you know, the price to pay is you got to try. Um, and trying involves the possibility of failure. Uh, you know, this isn't the first time where uh, people have done experiments biologically as well as, you know, socially. I mean, uh, maybe you guys have heard uh, about, like, the weird child sexuality experiments that were going on, you know, uh, uh, back in what is it you know mid, mid 1900s you know some like 1904 19 like 50s 60s uh, particularly in yeah, East Germany about the whole idea of you know uh, that the theory that you know that I I don't know why I haven't looked into it very much um, I think it might have been it, it would strike me as like well yeah there if they took it from like Freud you know might have been coming this whole idea of like maybe you know uh, sexuality being repressed in children, this causes other things. So they, they tried to do this whole free, the free love of children thing. Uh, and of course, you know, we find out later that uh, this stuff was happening and a lot of people involved were fucked up because of it. 
Uh, but did we know and could we have given a theory prior to that about how this, you know, was just a priori uh, not going to be true and therefore you know, we shouldn't do it? Um, no, we didn't really know. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, we're still in a position in which we still really don't know. Uh, because one can't pretend, that, for example, that the after effects uh, weren't affected by the revelation that this stuff happened, the realization that it wasn't normal for the people who were involved in it, uh, as well as, you know, the, the inculcation of an external world telling you this isn't right, and therefore you internalize that as well, and there you look back and you see your own, what's, what's something that might have been normal, uh, might have just been like, eh, you know, well that happened, well I didn't like it, but whatever. Uh, you know, and it transforms it into a traumatic experience of sorts. Uh, and so, you know, stuff like that uh, is not completely ruled out. Uh, but it's the kind of stuff in which, you know, you come to understand and think, uh, even though it's not known, um, there's just no ethical way to know this. So, you know, there's, there's nothing to be done uh, regarding that kind of stuff. You know, those questions are literally... Uh, uh, all right, man. So anyways, I was thinking about the whole uh, child hormone thing, about how that's, uh, that might just be a case of, well, we're going to find out in uh, 20 years uh, what came of that. Uh, you know, it's, my, might uh, have quite a few disastrous stories uh, and probably some, uh, you know, happy stories. Who knows? And uh, maybe 60 years from now we find out, holy shit, you know, changing the hormones uh, fucks a lot of shit up, you know, uh, beyond just psychological things. All right, I've been going for a bit, uh, had a couple of other things to talk about, but I'm uh, not seeing my fat boy, so I'm going to have to go and uh, search for him. <laughs> uh, hey, Dan. Uh, anyways, I'm saying that uh had a couple of other things to say, but, uh, you know, uh, my fat boy has not been answering, and he can't be... <laughs> yeah, so uh, he can't be too far, but... Uh, you know, I gotta go make sure that I find him. So, alright. Uh, thanks for tuning in. See you around.